Hello, family and friends. Welcome to day 33 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. I'm Kanoi. You can find me on Instagram at Kanoi Gibson or at Notes and Hughes. And make sure you are connected to our community on Facebook. The group is called Bible Study with Kanoi. You can find everything in the description box below, including my Bible study notes, as well as our Bible reading plan, lots of tools for Bible study, and also all the things that I use from my Bible to the highlighters and pens and all the good things. Before we get into the word, as always, always we want to pray and welcome the Lord here in this space so let's pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name your kingdom come your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever I thank you, Lord, for another day to be able to be alive, to be in your word, to read it, so that by hearing it, Lord God, we strengthen our faith. We thank you, God, that you are the Almighty, and we just pray today, Holy Spirit, that you will speak to our hearts, that you will help us to know you, that you will help us to hear your word accurately, and we will hear a specific word from you. I pray that you will whisper, Lord, but allow that whisper to be louder than all other distractions and all other voices that try to come and deter us from the truth. So I pray today that you will illuminate the truth, Lord, and I pray that you will have your way in each and every one of our lives. Meet their needs, Lord. I pray for healing, especially over those who are struggling in their bodies. Lord, for those who might have gotten a bad report from the doctor, God, you are our great physician and we trust in you. We trust that you are good and that your word is good and that your plan for our lives is good. So no matter what happens, Father, we trust you. And we thank you, Lord, that you are increasing that trust today. I pray you pour out your peace upon every single one of us, Lord, the peace that surpasses all understanding. We may not get it, Lord, but still our hearts. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yesterday we saw the beginning of the plagues being poured out on the people of Egypt as Pharaoh continues to harden his heart. Today we'll see the finality of those plagues being poured out and the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. Yesterday in chapter 9, we ended on the plague of the boils, and today in chapter 10, we start with the eighth plague, the plague of the locusts. Verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am Lord. So he is saying, This is going to be told to your sons, to your grandsons for generations, what I have done. The signs here that he has shown, he is showing that he is God. There's a revelation of who he is. So if anyone asks the question, why again is God pouring out these plagues on the people? It just seems to boggle our minds, but truly it is because he wants everyone to know who he is as the Lord, as God, as Yahweh, as Adonai. He wants everyone to know him. And without tests, there's truly no testimonies. So when you have authentic faith, that is going to always come from a personal experience or a personal encounter with God. And this is what we are going to see happen today in the end as finally the Egyptians encounter who God is. Verse 3, So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail, and they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen. From the day they came on the earth to this day, Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. So here he's saying, when are you going to humble yourself? Because his pride ultimately ends up being his own undoing. And the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So again, he's been given a lot of grace here. I mean, again, this is over the course of, gosh, what was it, a year? Where all these things keep happening and God just keeps allowing it to happen. God keeps allowing him more time to be able to turn, to repent, to humble himself, but he's not doing it. 
Verse 7, then Pharaoh's servants said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? So he, this snare is also uh, symbolizing a bird trap. Let the men go so that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So his servants are like, come on, man, what is going on here? Like they're obviously acknowledging that God is supreme over Pharaoh. And this is ultimately fulfilling prophecy that was spoken in chapter 7, verse 5, where it said that the people will know that I'm God. And we are seeing that here. We saw it in chapter 8 and also chapter 9 where that happened. And we'll see it again in chapter 12. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and he said to them, go serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? So he's like, yeah, yes, but no. <laughs> right? Like you can go, but not really. So he asked, but which one of you are going to go? Moses said, we will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters and with our flocks and our herds for we must hold a feast to the Lord. So Moses is like everybody, everybody going. Verse 10, but he said to them, the Lord be with you. If I ever let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men among you, the men among you, not the women, not the children, and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. But Moses, we're going to see, absolutely will not compromise his family because he knows that the entire family, that all their possessions need to leave Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt, such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before nor ever will be again. They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened and they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hill had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. So locusts ultimately bring an unprecedented damage to the land. It's nothing they've ever seen before. There's absolutely no green left. It's all brown. This is basically looking like the apocalypse in a sense without all the rubble. I mean, just at least as far as trees and plants go. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive my sin only this once and plead with the Lord your God to remove this death from me. So Pharaoh is getting, you know, he is, quote, bugged, right? Like he knows, okay, this is not good. Please remove this death from me. He knows that if the plants and the trees and the crops continue to get eaten, they're going to all die. They're going to starve. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. What, <laughs> what humility, right? How, how can Moses once again plead to the Lord on behalf of Pharaoh? Well, one, we know that this is God's purpose. So he's ultimately being obedient to the Lord. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people go. So when he says, and the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, once again, we are seeing clearly this was God's doing and this was not Moses. So we see that God is winning here a little bit because Pharaoh is finally confessing, <laughs> but we'll see what happened. I mean, he ended up hardening his heart once again. Now we go to the ninth plague of darkness. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So this darkness is going to be so dark that not only will it be a physical darkness, but also a spiritual darkness. And the reason why is because the Egyptians actually held the sun God as one of the most high, the highest God, the most supreme God. And this darkness may have felt like an attack on their gods, like a frontal attack. And so they may have even gone into a depression. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a cave where when they turn out the lights, it's the darkest dark that you will ever experience. I mean, we can't experience that 
in a normal society just because we've got the stars, we've got, you know, light that is illuminating from the earth, which ultimately goes into the sky. So you kind of never really get a pitch darkness. But if you go deep into a cave, you can experience that where you truly are unable to see anything. And I can only imagine what kind of depression this could bring. I mean, it's kind of like being put in isolation. They do that as, you know, as uh, punishment in prison. Can you imagine being in isolation with zero light? And God is the light of the world. Jesus, the light of the world. So you got to turn the light on. But this happened for three days. Now, the disciples also probably experienced this kind of darkness between Good Friday and the resurrection. For, so three days of spiritual darkness. And of course, we know that there were three hours of darkness as Jesus hung on the cross. So very significant, once again, the, the number three in the Bible. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. So Israel, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, not affected by this darkness. So just what was this light that the Israelites are experiencing? Remember, they don't live far away from Egypt. They live just right on the outskirts in Goshen. So it is likely that they should have experienced this darkness as well, but they don't. So what is it? Could it have been the Shabbat, the glory of God? With Jesus being the light of the world, it makes me think to myself, is the light on in my home? Is the glory of God shining in my own house? Because our families are our first ministry. Are we sharing the love of Christ with our children, with our husband, with our wives? Are we praying together? Are we fellowshipping together? It's so easy to do it with people on the outside, but are we shining the light in our own home? One of the most precious things that I experienced last night was I went to bed a little bit earlier than my own kids just because I was so exhausted. And at 10 o'clock at night, my son ran into my room. He's 12 years old in seventh grade. And he said, mommy, can we pray? And I'm not gonna lie, my flesh was like, ugh, cause I was so tired. But I said, yeah, we can pray. He prayed out loud. He led the prayer, not me. And I just thought to myself, this is the fruit that I'm seeing of years of praying with my children, that my son is gonna be a spiritual leader in his home one day. It is the most precious gift that we can give to them as parents. And one of the things that we love to do that we've always done before bed is we sing the Hawaiian version of the doxology. It's called Ho'onani, we sing it. Ho'onani kamakua mau, ke ke ki me ka uhane no, ke akua mau ho mai ka ipu, ko ke au, ko ke lau, amene. Even though they don't know what they're singing, it's etched in their heart, and it's something that I hope that they will carry on with their own children because it is a sweet sound to the Lord. He knows their hearts. That is the light that shines in our home. That is the light that I pray will continue to shine in their homes for generations to come. Verse 24, then Pharaoh called Moses and said, go serve the Lord, your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. So before he said, only the men can go. But now he's saying, okay, listen, you, your children, your wives can go, but you must leave your flocks and your herds behind. But Moses said, mm -mm, you must also let us have sacrifices and burn offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord, our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall let be left behind for we must take of them to serve the Lord our God, and we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. So he's saying, we need all of these animals because we need to make sacrifices, but we don't know which one of these will be the sacrifice until we arrive at the place. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. So Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. Now, why was Moses so insistent on taking every single animal and every piece of their belongings with them? I believe it is because he does not want to have one foot in and one foot out. Just the same way that we should not want one foot in the world and one foot out. But a lot of us do live that way. 
I mean, after all, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we will continue to be sinners until the day that God calls us home. But living with one foot in is a choice that we make. And Moses knew that if he left behind some of his belongings, some of the things that he treasures, he knows that where his treasure is, there his heart will be also. And there's a chance that because the treasures are left behind, his children and their children may want to go back to Egypt one day. So our choices now, where we have our treasures, where we have our feet, whether it's straddling the line or it's all in, it will affect our children and our grandchildren in the future. And the enemy does this to us in very subtle ways today. He's like, fine, you wanna believe, go ahead and believe. But just don't go to church on Saturday and Sunday when your kid has a wrestling tournament or a gymnastics competition. Guilty. Or he'll say, fine, go to church, believe in the word of God, but don't go all in. You don't need to give your tithe. You don't need to give your money. The church doesn't need it. So there are subtleties that the enemy will use to try to keep us from going all in. And now in chapter 11, we are going to see the final plague threatened but not yet carried out. It's a short chapter, but an extremely important one, as when God speaks, his children need to listen. Verse one, the Lord said to Moses, yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. So he's like, he is going to get rid of you guys. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold and jewelry. Now I couldn't help but ask, do they have the right to actually ask the Egyptians for silver and gold? Well, morally, yes, because they have served the Egyptians for centuries, for hundreds of years, 400 years. They have been serving them without compensation. So they absolutely have the right to finally be compensated. So here it is. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of people. So right here, we are seeing that the people are now starting to see that Moses is good. The people are good. And we will see later that some of them are actually going to say, take me with you. So Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt. So he is saying, I'm going to handle this one. I'm going to lead this charge. And every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill. So he is saying no one in Egypt is going to escape because this is the extreme opposite from the firstborn born of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the slave girl who is at the bottom of society and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry. This is prophetic throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. So this is speaking of God's great mercy on Israel. He is separating them from Egypt and he is not going to allow any of this to come upon them. So this whole part right here is prophetic. This is prophecy that is spoken. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. Okay, here is the chapter of the sticky notes. <laughs> chapter 12. This is the Passover. I feel like this is the chapter where our heads can start to spin a little bit and where we start to kind of on our own fall out of understanding the Bible. Up to this point, I feel like there were a lot of stories, a lot of, you know, prose. And even though most people say it's difficult to understand, for the most part, the stories were fairly simple to understand. I mean, there were the nuances that we have to kind of explain. But I always found that once we started talking about the feasts and the Passover and all the things, I would start to kind of lose interest. So hang with me. And I hope that this will make so much more sense to you today than it ever has in the past. Lord Jesus, help me. Holy Spirit, let's go. <laughs> Verse one, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, 
This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So this is of the Hebrew calendar, okay? So this is going to be their first month, this being April or May. So this is sometime around April or May, according to our calendar. And it is known in chapter 13 as Abib, also known as Nisan, okay? This time, this first time of the month. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, Every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. So he is saying every single family needs to take part. Okay. So each one has their own lamb. Every household has their own. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make for your count for the lamb. So if you have a, if you have a small family and you can't finish the entire lamb, then pair up with another small family so you all can finish the entire lamb. This is going to make sense in a second. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So from the 10th day, they get this lamb, sheep or goat, and then on the 14th day is when they kill it. Why? Well, it gives them four days to inspect the goat, sheep, lambs, whatever they have, for blemishes or disease, because this needs to be an unblemished lamb. And then looking at the calendar now, I just want to bring this into context here. So this is going to happen on the 14th day. This is going to be the Passover. Interestingly enough, Jesus actually died on the Passover. So this is all very prophetic of the coming of Jesus. Okay, let's see. Um, also, in AD 32, on the 10th, day, which is when the lamb is supposed to be picked out, Jesus went into Jerusalem. So AD 32, 32 years, Anno Domini, meaning the year of our Lord, 32 years after Jesus was born. So he was 32 years old on the 10th, on this day, he went into Jerusalem. He was also challenged for four days by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the enemies. But of course, he was found spotless. So these people will see it in the New Testament if you've never read it. He was challenged constantly about theology. They were like, but the word says, da, 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 da. And he was always able to shut them down ethically and theologically. And then I also want to take a look here. So this was the Hebrew calendar. So our calendar dates from the birth of Christ here in the Western Hemisphere. And we call that AD or Anno Domini. Now, the Hebrew calendar dates back to their departure from Egypt. So the calendar here is going to be their first month. This is going to be the start of their calendar was from when they depart from Egypt. Later, the Jewish calendar will start in somewhere around the fall, somewhere around September or October. And then, of course, here in the Western Hemisphere, we start it now in January after Christ was born. But then the Antichrist is going to try to change the calendar again. And we are already seeing signs of that as he wants to eradicate the name of Jesus. So now we see a lot of the times in history books, we don't see AD anymore. You see BCE or CE, CE meaning common era or before common era. So we are already seeing Jesus name being eradicated and in many places. I mean, you can't pray in schools anymore. You know, there's a whole a whole lot of stuff happening with that. I don't want to get into politics, but I'm just saying it's happening. Okay, where were we? Um, okay, then they shall take some of the blood, so of this lamb, put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night. So eating of the flesh... Does that sound familiar? We do this with bread during communion. Eat the flesh that night, roast it on that fire, on the fire, with unleavened bread. Unleavened, of course, leavening is a sign of sin. So we don't want leavening in our bread. And <clears throat> we speak of that, actually all throughout the Bible, it speaks of unleavened bread. And also bitter herbs. So you've got to have no yeast, but bitter herbs. Why? The bitterness is going to remind them of the slavery in Egypt. 
So this is a commemoration, this Passover feast. This is what they are to do. So unleavened bread, bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So they want none to be left here. You have to eat it that night. Why? Well, this is similar to or compared to the cross and how the work is done. It is finished. It is not to be continued. You, It was finished that night or that day and that was it. You know, there's, there's case closed. The work is complete. So that's what the Passover is also symbolizing. This is done. All right. And then... Um, why did they need to eat it in haste? Well, that is going to be a reminder about their escape from Egypt, because you will see where the Lord tells them, get out of here quickly. So let's read a little bit about the Passover. It's a commemoration of God's deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt. So every time they do this Passover, you know, in the years ahead, this is going to be in memory of what God did for them, how he is bringing them up out of Egypt. It points to the coming of the Savior, and we'll see how it does. Jesus was the Lamb of God, is the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. It says that in John 1, 29. Paul says he is the Passover Lamb in 1 Corinthians. And Peter says he's unblemished in 1 Peter 1. So the Passover Lamb was to be one without blemish, and we know that Jesus was without sin. He was perfect. He did not sin. Number two, it must be male. Obviously, Jesus is, must be young. Jesus was. Four, examined. And we saw that in those four days, I mean, actually throughout his entire life, he was examined by the public. Uh, number five, the stain shall be made in public. And clearly, Jesus crucified on the hill in front of everybody. It shall have no broken bones. And we know that even with the brutality of the execution on the cross, miraculously, Jesus had no broken bones. <clears throat> Number seven, the blood will serve as a symbol and that God would pass over and they will not destroy or he will not destroy them. So this is the same as the blood that covers our sin and we will not be destroyed. We will be able to live eternally in heaven with our Father, with Jesus. So ultimately, Jesus fulfills all of the prophecy of the Passover. Okay. It's a lot, I know. Get your sticky notes out. Or have a piece of paper to write something down on. Okay. Um, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you. So remember, a sign is a reminder. It's a memorial. It's a symbol. Here, it's a miracle that is pointing to the power of God. On the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So he's saying, I see, I will, I strike. So this is personally carried out by the living God and no one else. Verse 14, this day shall be for you a memorial day. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout the generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. So he is saying, this is a memorial day. In the years to come, let this be a day of celebration. There are some things within this week that will be somber. Some things will require fasting. But this particular feast, the Passover feast, will be a day of celebration. A statute forever you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now I know this sounds brutal, but cut off 
I believe means executed. That's, that's what my study notes said. And here I wrote, leaven is the symbol of sin. Jesus without sin to this day, the unleavened bread is poked and striped to symbolize Jesus' stripes and piercing before he was hung on the cross. So they still celebrate the Passover uh, in Israel and they will make this bread with the stripes and they'll pierce it. On the first day, you shall hold a holy assembly and on the seventh day, a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. So basically no work except to cook. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day, I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread during this time. Then Moses called on the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. So hyssop is usually a plant that speaks of humility. So he is saying dip that in the blood in the basin. And the basin was usually at the foot of the door. It was built in near the foot of the door. So they're going to dip it into the blood. And then they are going to touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. So take a look at this. Watch this. This is the basin at the base of the door. This is where the blood is in, in this thing call it a bucket. It's not a bucket, just like it's not an apple, but forgive my elementary words that I choose to use to help draw a picture. <laughs> People are coming at me like, it wasn't an apple that Abe ate. I know it wasn't an apple, but I grew up believing it was an apple because they taught us it was an apple in Sunday school. So that's all I said on day one or maybe day two or whatever day it was. We talked about Adam and Eve, but I know it's not an apple. Okay. So it starts here in the basin. Then they sprinkle it here at the top of the door, at the door, and then they sprinkle it on the two door posts. Look at what this creates. A cross. It's unmistakable that once again, this points to the coming of Jesus. Uh, none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. So let's just recap what's happened here. Okay. Israelites. Here's what you have to do. You get your lamb, you eat it at that, you eat it that night. It's got to be roasted. And then we are going to fast forward. Put the blood on the doorpost up here. When God comes over, when he passes over and he does so in a linear fashion, he's going to see the blood that is sprinkled and that identifies you as my people, as God's people, and he will not kill your firstborn. He's going to kill everybody else's firstborn in Egypt. So make sure that you do this so that you are identified as one of God's people. Okay. Um, okay. Verse 25. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, so this is the promised land, Canaan, you shall keep this service. So continue to do this, you guys. Not you guys. <laughs> we are freed from this from the when the cross, when Jesus died. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. So they were completely obedient to this. Now we are going to see the 10th plague or the death of the firstborn that was spoken of in chapter 11. So let's talk about the significance of this. Well, God regards Israel as his firstborn son. And I, for, I think I forgot to actually mention this when we read about it. It was in my notes. And let's go back here and see if we can find it. In, 
Okay, here. In chapter 4, where God says... Um, And the Lord said to Moses, so this is verse 21, chapter 4. When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If Israel is my firstborn, oh no, if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So this is where I was confused because I said, what? Is God saying he's going to kill the firstborn son of Moses? So, <laughs> and because I was looking the, where the parenthesis, I mean, the quotation marks were, it confused me in my Bible. Um, but I realize now that it was a continuation of what the Lord is saying to Pharaoh. And this is prophetic and it happened. So let's take a look here. So Israel is God's first son. But it's his adopted son. So the people of Israel are the adopted children of God. They are his people. God still loves Israel. But Jesus then becomes the symbol by which we become the heirs of God or the children of God. Jesus is the one and only begotten son. So he's the one and only son of God we are adopted. Okay. So we are adopted. Israel is adopted. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become children of God the way that Israel was considered children of God. Okay. So I hope that that cleared things up uh, because I was confused the other day. So I'm hoping it makes sense now. I will be confused because I do not know everything. All right. But thank you to everybody who did um, respond to that. <laughs> for those who responded to my confusion, I appreciate you because then it made me go back and look and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. So let's see here. So God regards Israel as his firstborn son because of the attacks on his firstborn son by Egypt. So Egypt has been for centuries now keeping these Israelites in slavery, you know, basically beating them down, making their work harder than it really should be. So the, now the Lord is repaying them. He had given them centuries to repent, to not be this way, but they chose to continue. So now the Lord is attacking Egypt's firstborn. It sounds brutal, but there's a purpose in it, and we will see it. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt. Remember we read about that? I said it was prophetic. The great cry is heard for there was not a house where someone was not dead. I cannot imagine the sound of this where every household has a person who is dead in it. As a mother, I mean, regardless of the fact that they're Egyptian, they are still people and they still have hearts. And I can't imagine knowing not only that my firstborn is dead, but that my neighbors are as well. So there's a great cry. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said. Be gone and bless me also. <laughs> I just thought, here's the brattiness of Pharaoh, where he's finally relenting. He's finally going to let the people go. But as they're kicked out the door, he's like, but don't forget me. Bless me too. So he's finally in a, in a space of brokenheartedness. Like his spirit is finally broken and admits that God is the true and living God. And he is superior to the many gods that Pharaoh likely worships. So here begins the Exodus. Does anybody else ever hear the Bob Marley song? Exodus. Okay. No, just me. Okay. <laughs> I always hear that every time I read the word Exodus. All right. The Egyptians were urgent. Great song, by the way. You should download it. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So remember, get out of here quickly. That's part of the reason of why we eat the, fur or the Passover meal in haste, because Jesus is or God is plucking them out of Egypt quickly. 
So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. So they, they don't even have time to let their bread rise. So the unleavened bread would later remind them of the haste of that night fleeing slavery. So it's kind of like taste association, sort of like the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs will remind them of slavery. The unleavened bread will later remind them of the haste, the quickness that they had to leave. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold and jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they let them have what they asked. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. So the Egyptians probably no longer respect Pharaoh. They, they realize now, okay, you know what? This tyrannical ruler that is over us, we don't respect him. We know that the Israelites' God is the one and only true God. And so they have no problem just giving them what they deserve. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. Ramesses is likely the store city that was mentioned in chapter one. Succoth being, quote, tent town, <laughs> about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So if we're talking about 600,000 men, if you add in the women and the children, this is going to be about 3 million that we see leave Egypt and start heading toward the promised land. Where that is confirmed, though, is in the census that is later done in Numbers. And that's going to be an exciting chapter, trying to read all those names. <laughs> a mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. So here we're seeing probably a mix of Egyptians, probably other ethnic groups who wanted to be with them. I mean, if you ever hang out with people who bring you joy, people who, you know, share the fruits of the spirit, are loving, are kind, are funny. I mean, you want to be around people like that. So these Egyptians are like, listen, I want to go hang out with those guys. I want to go be with them. They're, they are a lot more pleasant to be around than the people we've been around lately in our neighborhood. So the interesting thing is, is that later on, though, they end up causing problems among the Israelites. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. So here, even though leavening agents speak of sin, it doesn't mean that they can never eat leavened bread. So you can see here, they actually are break, they're going to bake things uh, that will be leavened. But here they're not. But I'm just saying, like, it doesn't mean you can't eat it. It's just symbolic in, in the case of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, um, chapter, no, verse 40. So they're departing now at about 1446 BC. That's what, I guess, scholars have brought it back to. So the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. So this is more of a solemn observation. This is not a night of celebration. It's a solemn one where... We today do a similar type of solemn, uh, not celebration, you can't say that, <laughs> but a, like a solemn event will be the celebration of the Last Supper. So some Christians still celebrate this. They call it Holy Thursday. Um, it is commemorating what Jesus did for mankind. This was the, the meal that he had with the disciples before he was crucified. Some research is now saying that it actually happened on Wednesday. I mean, I'm like, really, does it really matter? Because <laughs> ultimately what matters is that we believe in Lord Jesus, that we confess our sins, that we, you know, say that he is the Lord and Savior and the Messiah. But anyway, a lot of people get all caught up in the semantics and caught up in the words and dates and all of that stuff. Yes, it is important, but I'm saying it's not the be all end all. But regardless, I'm just saying we still we still celebrate in some uh, some places the Last Supper, and it's also called the Passover meal. So they're both symbolizing the same thing. What God did for the Israelites, we're also commemorating what Jesus did for all of mankind. 
Verse 43, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. So he's saying, listen, everybody who is an Israelite must partake in the Passover. No foreigners. So that meaning anybody who has not come to the faith of the living God cannot be a part of this. Why? Because if we allow anybody to be a part of this Passover celebration, it's going to water down the sacredness of this event. So they're saying no foreigners, but slaves. Slaves are the only exception, but they must be circumcised first. No foreign or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house and you shall not break any of its bones. So that was what we talked about earlier. So must be celebrated in each of the homes and it shall be marked by blood. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. It, If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no circumcised person shall eat it. So when we say he shall be a native of the land, if somebody decides that they want to be a part of this, they're they're the ones, one of the ones who are like, let us come with you. They must have the faith in the Lord, they must get circumcised. And then being a native of the land means that they're also going to have to share in the responsibility of this culture. Uh, There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. So now we're like, finally, the Israelites are freed. They're able to go. What is your Egypt? Is there something that God is calling you out of? Is he calling you out of a situation? Is he calling you out of a relationship? Is he calling you out of a way that you are living? Is he calling you out of a specific sin? He loves us that much that he will put it on your heart. Now, when we have Jesus, we don't have condemnation, but we will have conviction by the Holy Spirit when we are living out of step with his good and perfect will for our lives. So do you have an Egypt? Is the Lord calling you out of it today? Sometimes it may seem impossible. And sometimes we might get one foot out, but we left behind the flock. One foot remains in Egypt. But if you can just get yourself unstuck, if you could just get that one foot out of Egypt and continue to walk one foot in front of the other, building brick upon brick, being obedient in the small things, you will get there. You will be set free. And one of the greatest ways of being set free is with Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And there are so many other scriptures that speak of us believing in Jesus, believing in the word of God, hearing the invitation and our response to him being repentance and confession of our sins, ultimately declaring him Lord over our lives, we will be saved and have eternal life. Is that you? Do you know if you've ever accepted Jesus as your savior? If you don't know, we're gonna say a prayer and this is gonna be your response to the belief that the word of God is true. You will believe it, you will confess it with your own heart and mouth and this will be the day of your salvation. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you have done, that you sent your one and only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So I declare with my mouth today that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is my Savior and I belong to him. I believe, Lord, Jesus, that you came to this earth, that you died, that you paid the penalty for my sin by the shedding of your blood, just like the blood was placed on the doorposts of the Israelites. Your blood that was shed on the cross is what ultimately covers me and it keeps me in the house of God. I thank you so much that you rose again and I believe that you did. This is true. I'm responding to you today. Thank you. This is the day of my salvation. Forgive me of my sins. I turn today from them, Lord. Help me to walk in your way with your Holy Spirit. Do not let me turn to the right or the left, but keep me on track for time here is short and we do not know when our last breath will be. 
But what we do know is that our first breath after that will be in heaven with you. So I thank you for that, Lord. I praise you. I honor you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, for those of you who are still here, we will go over some of the study questions by the Bible Recap. In chapter 10, verse 7, even Pharaoh's servants plead with him to let the people go. He appears to listen to them at first. Why do you think he ultimately refuses? Some of the plagues are location specific or only affect the Egyptians. What do you think God is emphasizing by drawing this distinction? Look at the door frame. Imagine dipping a branch of leaves into the blood to paint a mark on the left side, the right side, also on the lintel or the top, and also dipping from the basin in the bottom. That doesn't say that here, but that's what we did. What an image does this create as the blood drips down from the top beam? What does this foreshadow? We did that, but it'll be fun to do it again. Review chapter 3, verses 20 to 22. What specific promises that seemed impossible does God fulfill in chapter 12? And according to chapter 12, verse 40, how long did the Israelites live in Egypt? Review the promise God made Abram in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Did God break his promise? What might account for this distinction? I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint. Uh, Chapter 12, verse 40. Let's see. Let's just go back here. I'm going to help you out with this because I want to make sure that I'm correct in what I am thinking this is talking about. Chapter 12, verse 40. Okay, I know what it says. It says that they, they lived in Egypt for 430 years, but the promise that God made to Abram in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 it says, if I can get past my stick, own sticky notes, 15 verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain and great dark, uh, that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they'll be afflicted for 400 years. So the question is, did God lie? <laughs> was he, he said 400 years, but it was 430. How could that be? Was this actually... So is this correct? Is somebody wrong here? Uh, Once again, speaking of uh, people getting caught up in semantics and caught up in the nitty gritty of some of the words, I think she talks about it though. I don't know if you all have read the Bible recap or if you've watched the video, but I, I think she speaks of it here. So let's take a look on what she, what Tara has to say. Uh, okay. They've been in Egypt 430 years, but don't worry, God isn't 30 years late for two possible reasons. 400 years could be a generality and not a down to the minute timeline, which we cannot box God in to what he says. I mean, you know, he says he created the earth in seven days, but was it in 7,000 days or years? (laughs) You know, a day in the Lord is a thousand years. So really, do we not, do we really know? Or the first 30 years may have included the time when Joseph first moved his family there before the second Pharaoh enslaved them. So we don't actually know, but what we do know is that the word of God is true. What it says is true. So that's our story and we are sticking to it. I will see you guys again tomorrow as we read, look how cute this is, this is from my friend Rachel, (laughs) as we read Exodus chapters 13 to 15, and before we begin our Sabbath day, the next day, chapters 16 to 18 that you will read on your own, and we will recap on Sunday. But until then, I will send you guys off with a hui ho, God bless you guys, and aloha.